All right, let's come to the Word of God together then this morning. Um, last week, as you know, I, I started a new series, just a three-part series in the tabernacle called A Dwelling Place for God. Now, we saw that the key to understanding the tabernacle is in its first mention where God said that he would make, uh, his people were to make a dwelling place for him to dwell. It was the one place on earth where the, the presence of God was manifested. Now, that's a picture of the church. The church is the temple of God. And the church is where the, the presence of God is manifest. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells in you. Amen. We're coming up to Christmas and we know that uh, the name of Jesus is called Emmanuel, which is God with us. God has come to dwell in us and is with us. Now many people, you know, we talk about the blessing of God and we are blessed because God dwells in us. Amen. Who remembers when you first got saved and uh, you used to look at your life in terms of your circumstances to determine whether you were blessed? You know, if things were going well, then you regarded that as being the blessing of God. But if you were going through difficult times and somehow you felt that the blessing of God had left you and you, you sought to get the blessing of God back into your life. You know, we had order calls, we were God chasers <laughs> trying to get something, but all the time God is with us. See, circumstances do not determine whether you are blessed. You are blessed because you are the temple of God and the presence of God dwells in you. Yes, there may be adverse circumstances, but if you can focus on the presence of God in your life, you will see God take those circumstances and turn them around and make them work for good in your life. You know, don't look at things. You might say, how can you say God is blessing me when so many people are against me? Well, you may have people against you, but God is for you. Amen. Amen. And if God is for you, who can be against you and prevail? Amen. He spreads a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Amen. And so you are blessed regardless of, of what is happening in your life. And, and when you know that it's the presence of God, it's the presence of God that determines that you are blessed, then you begin to see that manifest. You know, you, you don't have to chase things to try to make things happen. God gives you divine appointments. You just let it come to you. That's the grace of God. You don't have to make things happen. You are a blessed people and the blessing of God will unfold as you, as you just walk through life, walking by faith in the Son of God. Amen. Now, last week we looked at the first part of the tabernacle, which is the outer court. And we saw that what took place there is what enabled God to dwell amongst his people, and that was cleansing. We are a cleansed people. How clean are you? So clean that God has taken up residence inside you. Amen. You can't get cleaner than that. God will not dwell with sin. But because you are joined to Jesus, you are one with him, you are righteous, you have been perfected by him. And God is very much at home living in you, the temple of God. Now, we come to the actual tabernacle itself uh, this morning. And... Uh, we can just bring the, I don't know what's happening here. We, can we just bring this up, the first uh, slide? Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we've missed one, did we? Okay. All right. Um, we'll just stay with that one for a moment then. Um, the tabernacle consisted of 48 boards or planks that were placed alongside each other in a shape that was like a box, okay? And uh, these planks represent actually you. Uh, you probably go home this morning and say, well, that's great. He called me a plank of wood this morning. <laughs> but 
You know, the, just stay with it for a moment because these planks came from the acacia trees that once had their roots in the earth. Think about it. You once had your roots in this world. You once had your roots in Adam. But the gospel came along, the gospel of grace, and cut you down, took you out of this world, took you out of Adam. And, and the, the planks were, 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 were cut to size, perfectly shaped. And then here's the wonderful thing. They were overlaid with gold. You've become a partaker of the divine nature that you might be placed in the house of God. And at the, the base of these uh, planks or boards, there were two hands, like tenons. And these fit into side, inside what was called silver sockets that were sunk in the sand. Remember, this thing had to be erected in the sand. There was no, there was no rock for it to be anchored to. So they made these silver sockets. Each board had two tenons that fitted into a silver socket. And the silver was provided by the people. Every day, once a year, they all had to come and give some ransom money as a reminder that they had been ransomed. They had been redeemed. A price had been paid for them to become the people of God. And so actually when you add up the weight of all these silver sockets that became the foundation of the tabernacle, it weighed about five tons because it had to anchor this thing in the desert. You understand that? So that it could stay solid. The winds might be blowing and howling, but it was rock solid. It was stable because it was anchored in these silver sockets. And Peter says, you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your aimless con conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus as with a, a, a lamb, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now, let's just move on a little bit. Here's a side view of the, uh, the tabernacle. Okay, now, let's see if I can get this thing going. There we go. There were five bars. See the one bar there, see that? One bar there, two, two half lengths. Then there was a bar that went the full length in the middle. And then another two half bars, half length bars. They were called bars. Now, why were they there? Well, the silver sockets kept them anchored so that they didn't blow away. But they could still blow over. You see that? Sometimes there were strong winds that blew through the desert. And these bars kept them together, kept them as a tabernacle, kept them joined together and from being scattered and, and tossed around. Now, what does this represent? Personally, I believe it's a beautiful picture of what we call the fivefold ministries. You know, apostles and prophets. Down the base here, the church is built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophets. They're usually mentioned together. Then we have the long arm of the evangelist who reaches outside the church into the world to bring converts into the church through the gift of evangelism. And then we have the ministry of the pastor and teacher. Now you might say, well, that's a little bit fanciful interpretation but remember the purpose of the bars was to stop the boards getting blown around and the bible says this that god has placed in the body of christ apostles prophets evangelists pastors teachers so that we're not tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive so God has given us ministries to prevent us from being blown around. Isn't it beautiful? The silver sockets that anchor us to the redemption of Jesus and ministries to keep us together, to keep us as the church of God from being blown around because doctrines continuously blow through the church designed to scatter the people of God, to confuse them, to scatter them every which way. But God has raised up ministries so that we can be sound in the Word of God and remain upright in those times. Now, okay, that was the tabernacle. That's the box, if you like. 
and, and uh, over the box. It was overlaid by two sets of curtains. The first was a curtain of fine twine linen, which was white. So when you come in, that was what you saw. You look up into the, the ceiling and you saw this white. You look at the walls and you saw this white curtain. What is it a picture of? The righteousness of Jesus. You see how God really wants us to understand that we are the righteousness of Christ. That we're in Christ and that we're righteous because we are joined to him. Now that was overlaid by, by another curtain and also by, by other coverings. And uh, we won't go into the detail of all that because uh, of time. But let's come into the tabernacle itself. And, and when we come into the tabernacle, into the holy place, we see that there were three things there. One was called the menorah, the lampstand. The, other, the second was called the table of showbread. And the third was called the altar of incense. Now I'm going to talk about two of those today because I want to talk about the third tomorrow because the order of incense is basically the altar upon which the coals were burning and the priest took the coals from that altar to take their incense to go into the presence of God to worship the Lord. So that's connected really with the Holy of Holies. You understand that? So I want to talk about, first of all, the golden lampstand. The I think we might even have a picture. There, there's a picture of that. What I want you to understand is how that was constructed. It wasn't made by people just giving pieces of gold, then melting it all down and putting it in a mould, and this is the shape of the mould. It wasn't made that way. It wasn't made by, you know, that central shaft there uh, and the branches being added or joined to it so that there are, there are attachments to it. It wasn't made that way. Actually, it's quite amazing how it was made. It was one block of solid gold. And uh, the craftsman would beat that piece of gold and draw out from it the branches into that shape. What we, we call it the menorah, but it's the seven branch lampstand. And that's a beautiful picture. You know, everything in the temple, everything in the tabernacle is a beautiful picture of the reality that we have in Jesus. And the reality that we have in Jesus is this, that you and I are not actually an afterthought in the mind of God. We're not something that's been attached to Jesus. When God, the counsel of God, if you like, decided to send forth Jesus, the mediator, into the world at the same moment, the exact same moment, you were conceived in the mind of God. When God determined to send Jesus to earth, it was to redeem a people, and God knew those people from, the founda from before the foundation of the world. It's beautiful. Um, in the book of Hebrews, it says, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which cause, or for which reason, he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Now, you've got to ask, what's the purpose of the lampstand? And obviously, it's to give light. Okay? Now, just watch this for a moment. When you come into the outer court, the light that we have in the outer court, just as you step outside today, is natural light. Okay? That's the light of the world. Now, that represents the wisdom of the world, the light of the world, human reason and understanding. You cannot bring that into the holy place. You understand that? If there was no lampstand, there would be total darkness. The light of the world was not brought into the holy place. God set the lampstand there and the light of the holy place was to come from that lampstand. 
Now, what is that a picture of? It's a picture of the Word of God. You see, we don't have the wisdom of the world when we come into the, the church. We leave that outside. Our human understanding, our human reasoning, that is not the light that gives light in the house of God. God has given us His Word. Amen? And so that's the only light that is brought to bear in the house of God. God has given us this Word for that reason. When we go from the holy place into the holy of holies, the lampstand is not there. When we go to heaven, we won't need the Bible. Amen? I guess that makes me redundant as a Bible teacher, but I can handle that. What is the light of the Holy of Holies? It's the Shekinah glory. Only one man went in one part of one day every year on the Day of Atonement. And on that day, the Shekinah glory lit up the Holy of Holies. Now look at this. It says there shall be no night there. They shall need no lamp, the lampstand, nor light of the sun. There'll be no sun. You think, how could we survive without a sun? That's on this planet. Friends, where we're going is far greater than our solar system. For the Lord God gives them light. God will be our light in eternity. But now we're in the holy place, as it were, in this analogy, okay, don't get legalistic on me. In this analogy, where God has brought us into the house of God and the light he's given to us is the light of his word. What importance does that give to the word of God? Amen? It's the only light we have. That's why it was never to go out. It was never allowed to go out. It was... If, if, it was, if it went out, it had to be taken out and, and uh, uh, dealt with and, and brought back in and lit once again. Now, what that tells me is the purpose of the church. You know, we're not here to run around meeting everyone's need. That's a part of the function. I understand that. We minister to one another. God has not raised up the church so that we can run around having programs and doing this and doing that. The, the church is called to do what only the church can do. And that is to bring the word of God to the people. God has deposited truth to the body of Christ in the word of God. Let's have a look at what Paul says here. He says, I write to you so that you might know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. The pillar, and I think the, the word is the mainstay of truth. God has taken his word and he's deposited it in the house of God. He wants us to preserve it. Many men and women have died defending the word of God, translating it, ensuring its accuracy, standing up for it, and, and ultimately paying the price with their own life so that the Word of God might go forward. Amen? God wants us to preserve it. He wants us to uphold it. He wants us to teach it, to expound it. He wants us to preserve it. He wants us to pass it on to the next generation intact. Amen? because it is the light in the house of God. When we get away from the word of God, then we go into darkness, spiritual darkness. Amen. Now, moving on from there. Um, we read in the book of Revelation, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, this is Jesus, the book of Revelation, the first three chapters, is the only account in the Bible we have of Jesus coming to church and commenting on church. 
That's why those chapters are very important. Here we see, in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about with the chest, uh, about the chest with a golden band. Okay, the seven lampstands were the seven churches of Asia. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, as I said before, it was imperative that the light never went out in the holy place. Otherwise, it would be plunged into darkness. There was no other light but the lampstand. Now, what was it that could cause those lights to go out? Two things, basically. Number one is that um, the lamps were fed by oil. It was oil that burned. And so the, the oil had to continuously be supplied to the lampstand. You know, if you've got the King James Version, it's a very unfortunate translation. Um, if there's any diehards here, I'm <laughs> you know that the, the, the word is not lampstand, but candlestick. It's not a candlestick. A candle burns by the consumption of itself. Amen? You had a candle in black house, the candle burns, but when, when, when it's all gone, it's all over. Amen? But the lampstand always stands. It just needs to be continuously supplied with the oil. Now, what is the oil? The oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And so we need the Word of God, but we need the Spirit of the Lord to continuously make known to us the meaning of God's Word, to bring to us the life of God's Word. Amen? Somebody said, if you've got the Word of God without the Spirit of God, you'll dry up. But if you've got the Spirit of God without the Word of God, you'll blow up. But if you've got the Word of God and the Spirit of God, you'll grow up. Amen? And so the Spirit of God continuously supplied oil to the church and to understanding the Word of God to give light in the church. Now the other thing that could cause, and let's just look at um, a scripture there. From the throne proceed lightning, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the spirits of God. And so we we're talking here about the, the ministry of the Holy Spirit with the Word of God bringing light to the church of God. Amen. Now, the other thing that could cause those lamps to go, go out is that they had wicks. And if those wicks just kept burning, you know, the, the char would become so thick that the, 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 the lamps would become very smoky. So the place would be full of fumes, you know, understand? Be very smoky. And, and so regularly, there were instruments that were used by the high priest. He had to go in and trim, trim those wicks. Just nip off those bits of char so that it was all clean again and the lamp could burn brightly. Now that was the ministry not of the priests, but of the high priest. That's the ministry of Jesus. Jesus comes to bring correction to our lives. He uses the word of God to bring adjustment to our lives. And that's what he was doing in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3. As he come to the churches, he brought the word of God that was pertinent to each church to bring correction so that the light could keep burning. See, God does not want to remove a candlestick or a lampstand, I should say. God does not want to shut churches down. God wants to bring correction. God wants to bring cleansing. God wants to bring adjustment so that the light 
which comes from the Word of God will go forth pure and bright. Okay, let's, uh, let's just go back here. Jesus said, Remember therefore from where you have fallen. This is what he says to the first church, by the way, the church at Ephesus. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What was that? Jesus was coming, our great high priest, and just nipping the top of the wick, making it clean again so that the light could shine once again. The light was going out. The light was becoming uh, uh, very smoky. But Jesus, the high priest, was coming to minister to that. Remember, Jesus said, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. And so the lampstand was given so that the light of God through the word of God might continuously be given to the church. This is our light. This is our light, friends. We're not interested in the wisdom of the world. You know, the foolish of, foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of man. Amen. Amen. You know, people can call us old-fashioned, out of touch, irrelevant, and so on. It doesn't matter to us. Amen. The foolishness of God is wiser than the wisdom of men. This is the counsel of God, the whole counsel of God. And uh, by the grace of God, the light is going to continue to shine. Was that an amen from heaven? <laughs> Praise God. Okay. <laughs> so far, so good. All right. Now, the second thing that I want to just touch upon briefly is the table of showbread. Okay. There's two things. There's the table and there's the bread that was on the table. They're both a picture of Christ. A table is a symbol of fellowship. Food on the table, we come and we fellowship around what is on the table. We have a meal together, we partake of that, and we have fellowship together. Now, the table is the sustainer, Christ the sustainer of our fellowship. The bread was supported by the table. That's where it was placed. Sometimes, in transit, it remained on the table while it was being carried from one place to another. So how did it stop from going off the side? Well, there was a border. And in fact, the Bible says it was a hand breadth. I love that. A hand breadth all the way around. And on top of the border, there was a crown. Now try to get that picture. So as the table was being transported, the bread would probably roll from side to side, but it would not fall over. It's a beautiful picture of our security in Christ. You know, somebody was asking me uh, in the week about the whole doctrine of eternal security and how so many people believe that you can lose your salvation. If you don't do this, if you don't do that, and you must do this and you must do that, otherwise at the end you could find that you're kicked out. Now the fact of the matter is that we are kept by the power of God. That hand all the way around that border all the way around the table kept the bread, the loaves, secured. Incidentally, there were two rows, the Jews and the Gentiles, which would become one body, the body of Christ. But look at this. Jesus said, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. You're in the hand of God. That's why you're secure. My Father who has given them to me is greater than them all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. There was a hand breadth all the way around that table and, and it, there was a crown on top of it. God's glory is involved in your security. You see, if it was up to you, then you would get the glory. If, it was, if you got to heaven because you kept yourself and you overcame this and you overcame that and you persevered here, then at the end you would say, I did it. Glory to me. Amen? But there's no boasting in grace. Where is boasting? It's excluded. Amen. You know, when God brought Israel out of Egypt, you remember when they made the golden calf and God was going to destroy them? 
And Moses interceded. And he said this. He said, if you destroy this people in the desert, what are the Egyptians going to say? What are the nations going to say? Oh, he brought them out, but he couldn't take them in. He could only bring them this far. That's all he could do. Then he failed. Think about your name, Moses said. I love Moses. A little bit of manipulation going on there. But think about your name, he said. Think about your glory. You brought these people out there. Your people, your glory is involved in bringing them through and presenting them into the promised land. Amen? Amen. And it's like that with us. The Bible says uh, in, in, in the Psalms, uh, he restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. His glory is involved in your salvation and in the persevision. He who began the good work, he will complete it. He will present you faultless. And to him be the glory. There's a crown on that border, friends. And it's the crown of God which is going to bring glory to his name. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the bread... If, 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 if the table speaks about Christ, the sustainer of our fellowship, the one who upholds it all, then the bread is the substance of our fellowship. You see, regularly the priests would eat that bread and it would be replaced by fresh bread. They would eat that bread and it would be replaced by others. And just as the priests got their physical sustenance from eating the bread from that table... So Christ is our spiritual food. He is the means of our spiritual sustenance. We feed upon Jesus. Amen. Amen. We feed upon Jesus. He's the one that gives us strength. And friends, I've got to say this. I hope you're learning to feed upon Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one who can sustain you. Jesus is the only one that can satisfy you. Jesus, as we've just been rejoicing in, is the only one who is faithful to you and who will uphold you all through your journey in life. Amen. Amen. You know, he said on one occasion, I'm the bread of life. I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. The true Christian life consists of feeding from the bread that is on the table. And that bread is Jesus himself. Amen. You know, there's a time when Jesus was hungry he was thirsty. His disciples went away to get some bread. You remember then that woman came and he ministered to her. And, and then after a long time, they came back. By then he would have been really hungry. They said, we've got some food for you. He says, I have food to eat that you know nothing of. I wonder, do you know that food? It's the food that will sustain you when other things do not sustain you. If you look to created things or created beings to sustain you, to feed your soul, you will be disappointed. You will hunger again. You will thirst again. Amen? Jesus is the bread of life. And the true Christian life consists in feeding on him falling in love with him, having a real relationship with him, feeding on his righteousness, feeding on his goodness, feeding on his gentleness, on his compassion, on his loveliness, on his beauty. Amen. Amen. That's fellowship, that's intimacy. And that's what sustains us in our Christian life. For myself, I have bread. But maybe you know not of, I don't know. But I hope you have learned to feed upon Jesus, the bread of life. Shall we pray? 
Father, we thank you today for this beautiful picture we have in the Old Testament of some of the things that you've given to us in Jesus. Lord, though I've tried so imperfectly this morning to, to share some of those realities, I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring these things by revelation to us. Lord, we thank you that you have placed a beautiful light for the house of God. It's sufficient. We don't need to add to it. We just need to ensure that it doesn't go out. The word of God. Lord, may we walk in that light. May we bring that light to the church and to the world, we pray. We thank you, Lord God, for Jesus, who is our sustenance who keeps us strong, who keeps us satisfied. Lord, if we have everything, but we don't have him, we have nothing. If we have nothing, but we have him, we have everything. I pray that you'll teach us to truly feed upon the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God.